Brent already uh, said my paper title. Uh, today I'm talking about research uh, on the 2013 Canadian federal prisoners strike. This research comes out of my uh, dissertation research and was uh, based on a chapter of that. Uh, so to give an overview of this strike, uh, so what I'm talking about is a strike that occurred mostly in October 2013 and happened in response to the implementation of a 30% wage cut for federal prisoners. This was part of a broader uh, Harper conservative government tough on crime agenda and a suite of changes that were made to the prison system at that time. Um, this policy was uh, supposed to save or purported to save $4 million. And to put that into perspective of the uh, Correctional Services of Canada's billion dollar plus budget, that is about the same amount of money as would be saved by paroling 53 federal prisoners. Uh, uh, the bulk of the lasted about a month, although at some prisons or some units within prisons, uh, stayed on strikes into January of 2014. And overall, at least 18 of Canada's 43 federal prisons uh, participated in the strike. It's difficult to actually get the full picture, but based on my research, uh, 18 uh, prisons were confirmed to participate. And this crossed Canada and included institutions in all of CSC's five reason, regions of Atlantic, Quebec, Ontario, Prairies, and Pacific. So just to kind of illustrate what the strike looked like uh, on the first day, three prisons in Ontario, Bath Collins Bay, or sorry, four prisons, Bath Collins Bay, Fenbrook and Workwork institutions struck. Uh, and this was the first day that the pay cut policy came into effect. By October 3rd, uh, prisons in New Brunswick, Quebec and Saskatchewan had joined. And by October 10th, 10 more institutions had joined, the strike became Canada-wide uh, with prisons in Manitoba and BC also joining in. I want to uh, do a bit of an aside here and just say something about federal prison labor in Canada so people have a sense of uh, what kind of jobs prisoners were striking from. Uh, in Canada, in the federal system, there's basically two main types of work. The first one being institutional maintenance so this is working directly to make the uh, facilities or institution run. So cooking, cleaning, clerical work, uh, trades work, that kind of stuff. And then secondly is prison industries run by uh, what's called a special operating agency uh, called CORCAN. And CORCAN uh, has different business lines, uh, agriculture, construction, manufacturing, textiles, and services, and those services are mostly laundry and printing services. And CORCAN uh, largely produces for what's called state use, which means that it is the correctional system uh, and the government kind of more broadly, who's the main customer of CORCAN and purchases the goods and services produced by it. Uh, there is a very small amount of private contracting of CORCAN prison labor there's a wrought iron fence company in Quebec and a fishing lure company in BC, uh, but this is really uh, not a very significant part of uh, Canadian prison industry. Until the uh, pay cuts were implemented in October 2013, the top pay for working uh, prisoners in the federal system was $6.90 per day, not per hour, but per day. Uh, and this was a wage which had been set in 1981, which means that in addition to the pay cuts that came into effect in 2013, prisoners had experienced effectively, you know, a 30 plus year uh, wage freeze and their wages were eroded by uh, inflation over that time. The average wage of a prisoner in 2013 when the strike happened was $3 per day. And those working in Corcan industries uh, were entitled to incentive pay, which ranged from $1.25 to $2.50 per hour. So that's like peanuts in the scheme of uh, you know, normal uh, work in the free world, but somewhat significance in terms of what people were making in prisons, uh, that incentive pay. And that incentive pay was completely cut by the same policy that uh, reduced wages in general. Uh, I want to talk a bit about how the strike was planned and coordinated. 
Uh, I kind of have to be brief here so that we don't spend all day. Um, but organizers began planning against the cuts as soon as they were announced earlier in 2013 in May. And organizers that I spoke to um, very much indicated that they began organizing around the issue partially to avoid the possibility of riots breaking out and saw uh, organizing in favor of a strike as a way of mitigating that. Although uh, strike organizers were kind of split and had different opinions between whether pursuing things through kind of legal channels in a lawsuit or work stoppages and strike uh, action would be more effective. In the end, prisoners uh, ended up doing both. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, several organizers ran for and won uh, elected range representative and inmate committee positions and were able to use these uh, elected and authorized positions within the prison system to kind of um, organize, organize the strike. And there were attempts at coordination between organizers, especially uh, between institutions, especially those on inmate committees. But inmate committees uh, in Canadian federal prisons are only authorized to communicate with each other uh, with CSC approval and prison strike organizing is not a uh, authorized activity, as you could imagine. Um, and so that meant that most efforts to communicate between institutions had to happen through mail and the letters that people sent each other did not arrive until after the strike had basically finished. There was also uh, some effort to do kind of public outreach and build public support for the strike. Uh, prisoners wrote op-eds, appeared on radio uh, and podcast episodes, and made some efforts to try to uh, reach out to supporters in, in different uh, cities. Although this was mostly unsuccessful once the strike happened, uh, support committees sprung up in a few places, Winnipeg and Kingston and Montreal in particular, but these were quite uh, ad hoc and spontaneous support efforts and the support committees were not in touch with each other at all. Um, some of my most interesting research on the strike I think has to do with the ways that prisoners built solidarity and tried to maintain unity throughout the strike. Uh, it's worth talking about the fact that there was broad buy-in from prisoners in general, but also through whatever existing formal organizations were allowed to exist in the prison. And this meant that inmate committees, which I've already talked about, but also cultural and service and uh, religious groups were all important nodes of uh, organizing and building a kind of broad consensus that a strike should happen. So this meant that you know, Native Brotherhoods uh, or Christian fellowships or Alcoholics Anonymous groups would go about their normal business, but also provided some sort of space uh, for people to talk about the strike and to try to, you know, build build agreement that strike activity should happen. Uh, moreover, uh, organizers deliberately tried to institute democratic uh, decision making processes in the lead up to and throughout the strike, uh, again, in order to ensure that there was broad buy-in and the strike would be viable. And so this looked different in different uh, prisons. Some had mass meetings, some had uh, open votes and others had very formal processes uh, with secret ballots. Uh, I, I got an account from an organizer in Donnacona prison in, in uh, Quebec and they actually had uh, guards help them run a secret ballot uh, strike vote. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, also important in maintaining unity uh, were a few things that were indicated to me. Solidarity economies, especially important in prison, was uh, food sharing as a way to kind of shore up morale and basically substitute what would be strike pay in a different situation. And there were also visible representation of, of unity. The most common thing that I talk to people about being the growing of strike beards. And this actually reminds me of something I should have mentioned earlier. Uh, which is, I could talk more about the dynamics of who participated in the strike and who didn't, but one interesting thing uh, is that it was ended up being all men's prison who struck despite there being support for the strike uh, from many of the women's prison in Canada. And so uh, I just wanted to give a bit of testimony from some of the organizers that I spoke to for this uh, research. Uh, so this is Jim, uh, who's a 
a pseudonym for an organizer uh, in Joyceville uh, prison talking about the uh, decision to go on strike there. So he says, you've got representatives of different groups, representatives of different ranges, you know, living units. And basically you hold a large meeting with everybody or as many of those leaders, executive members of the different groups and representatives of different segments of the population. And then there's a vote taken. So, you know, a pretty deliberate and formal process there. And then I also wanted uh, to uh, quote uh, Earl, another organizer in Joyceville talking about this solidarity economy that I mentioned. And he says, most of the guys that had pull would lead by example and spend five bucks on somebody else, $3 on someone and help them out just so we would stick it out. You know, if one side of the institution is having canteen and the other side is not, then one side is thinking, I don't wanna be part of this anymore. Uh, so what happened in response to the strike? Uh, the Correctional Service of Canada at different times acknowledged that protests were occurring at different institutions, refused to engage in any kind of national negotiations. Uh, in terms of the government, uh, immediately after the strike started, the uh, Public Safety Minister Stephen Blaney said that the strike was offensive to hardworking law-abiding Canadians and basically indicated that the government was not going to uh, enter into any kind of negotiations. Similarly, um, a week or so into the strike, the Ministry of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness uh, called it a silly publicity stunt. And then from uh, the opposition uh, parties in, in government, uh, nothing was, was said publicly. And likewise, um, the labor movement and the left was essentially silenced uh, on the strike. One exception being the Federal Guards Union uh, the UCCO, who basically used the strike as a way to highlight their own issues and said that the wage cuts compounded the danger in an already volatile situation in federal prisons, basically drawing attention to their own health and safety concerns. Uh, that said, there were some minor concessions, one in individual prisons, for example, in Joyceville, uh, in Corcan shops, all uh, workers were granted the highest level pay uh, which is still a, a small amount, but represented some kind of win to the strikers there. Uh, but ultimately the policy was implemented in the, a later lawsuit that came out of um, the uh, opposition to this pay policy also failed. Uh, and so what I kind of want to end with here is if this strike, which is very much uh, something nearly unprecedented in Canada's history, you have to go back to the kind of troubled uh, times of the 1970s to find anything similar. Could a future prison strike be successful? Uh, or maybe what would it take for a future strike to be uh, successful? So one thing that I wanna mention is the fact that uh, labor strikes have been identified by prisoners as being uh, viable tactics because they represent potentially more leverage than other kind of tactics like hunger strikes, you know, which rely on kind of people, you know, moral appeals, um, but that they don't have the same kind of economic leverage that a labor strike might have. And so if there's greater dependency on prison labor, this probably could translate into greater economic leverage. And there is some uh, possible indication that this is occurring uh, since during the COVID-19 crisis, Corkin has a uh, pandemic, I should say, has, Corcan has re retooled some of its shops to produce uh, personal protective equipment. It's unclear exactly, you know, to what extent that's the case or how important that is, but I think it, it's an interesting potential signal uh, that prison labor might actually be uh, important. Uh, smaller and more localized strikes since 2013 have been able to be successful, and so there is the potential of, of these maybe scaling up somehow. Uh, prisoners have won uh, gains through, through labor strikes around better food and, and uh, larger food portions. And again, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, issues around basically health and safety, more cleaning supplies and, and masks and personal protective equipment. Uh, that said, I think what my research shows, and I'd be happy to talk in more detail about this, is that there is uh, serious barriers to uh, 
prisoner strike activity in Canada. There's a clear need for greater organizational capacity for prisoners. Uh, you know, the lack of any kind of outside coordination body um, to facilitate communication or to the building of a broader coalition of support, like especially from potentially the labor movement uh, are, are a few obvious things uh, that seem to be barriers now or, or would have to be developed in the future. And, you know, with that said, I think it, it's interesting to me looking at uh, the failure of the uh, prison strike in 2013 to say, uh, if this isn't a viable form of prison protest, then what might prisoners choose to engage in? And again, during COVID-19, there's been a number of hunger strikes, uh, especially in facilities like immigration detention facilities where work is not very significant. Um, and of course, you know, there is always the possibility of riots um, becoming a, a potential outlet to uh, discontent in Canadian prisons. So uh, that's all I have for now, and I'm looking forward to the discussion.